here today. Did you like that song? Yeah, I, I did. And uh, of course, because Caleb and I chose it. But, um, you know, I, I know some might say, isn't Jesus the one building the church? Yes, he is. I would encourage you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Because it says that we are God's fellow builders. If anyone builds on another foundation other than Jesus Christ, his work will be burned up. Guess that? what makes us builders of his church. I am and we are building the church of Jesus Christ because we are his body. He is our head. The spirit that was in Jesus is in us and we are building his church today. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm grateful to be part of that work today. So um, I'm loving the series so far, uh, Pursuit. And our goal is to help each of us see the passion of God in us because the spirit of God is within us to seek and to save those things, those circumstances, those opportunities, those people in our life that have been lost. There are things in all of our lives that we say, man, if there was only way, a way to go back and reclaim, restore what has been lost, that person who has been lost, there is a way in Jesus Christ. There is no situation too great for him. There is nothing impossible with God. We believe that here. We proclaim that gospel here. So we're going to keep proclaiming that in this series. So to help us with this idea of pursuit, we are going to start something in a couple of weeks that will be basically a church-wide scavenger hunt throughout this entire area. So here's what's going to happen. You'll get a card in two weeks and we're going to go on a pursuit treasure hunt, you and your family. And so we're going to do this for four weeks. And what I'm going to do is hide this box right here. It's a little tin box. Clue, it has a magnet on the back. Store that away. And inside this box will be a QR code. Woo, they are. They came out already. So you will be able to hold your camera on that code. And when you do and you go to the link, it will sign you up for a drawing we will do at the end of the series for $100 worth of gift cards to some local restaurants, okay? So what we're going to do is like the first week, I'm going to hide this in Ovilla, and you will get a card that has some Bible verses or references on it. Your job will be to look at those Bible verses and determine what in those verses are the clues that will point you to where this is? Interested? Cool stuff, huh? And we're going to do that every week. I'll do the first week in Ovilla, the second week in Midlothian, the third week in Waxahachie, fourth week we're back in Midlothian again. So anytime during the week, you can go out with your family. It's a great event. Uh, you can take, take your Bible with you, your Bible app, whatever it is. You can look up the verses that we'll give you for that week, and they will be clues to where this will be hidden. So uh, you'll, you'll find it, you'll open it, you'll take a picture of it or, or point your camera at it to get you to the link and then you'll want to put it back wherever it might be, clue. Uh, you put it back for the next person to come and find it, right? So more about that coming up next week. But that helps us in this whole uh, idea of pursuit. Uh, as we pointed out, Jesus is the head of the church he is the one who came seeking that which was lost, and he came in pursuit of us when we were lost. And so we acknowledge that truth here, that he is the head of the church. I am not the head of the church. Our elder team is not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. Amen? And we all have a role in the body, in the church. My role is to be a pastor who teaches and equips the members for the work of ministry, our staff is all about that as well. Our elder team is committed to that same vision as well. And so as we do that in our culture today, uh, it, it brings us to some interesting questions because we want to do what Jesus wants to do, right? We're not doing our thing, coming up with our plans and asking Jesus to bless them. That's not what we're doing. We are seeking him and what he has to say as the head of the church we want to see what he's passionate about, what he is doing, and then do that and be passionate about that. Because when we do what he has said to do, he's already promised there'll be a blessing. I don't actually have to, this is going to sound weird, stay with me. I actually don't have to ask him to bless what he's already promised he will bless. 
It's true. We just need to do what he's told us to do. And he has said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. He's already promised that, right? So I don't, we as the church don't have to get stressed about trying to bring all to ourselves or here to the church or even to Christ. He said, if we will lift him up, he will draw all men to himself and women and children and boys and girls. So we just get in line with what he's already commanded and promised he would bless. Amen. Now it gets challenging in our day because I think today the church faces something in America that the church has never faced in America's history. There's always been opposition to the gospel. Jesus said that was going to happen. But in our nation's history, I think we stand at a different place today than perhaps we've ever stood. There is a different reaction to the gospel and to the church. And our message is in direct odds and opposition to the message of the culture today. For example, the Bible tells us some significant truths. One of them is that the soul that sins will die. There, there is a punishment that comes for those who sin. The Bible tells us if we confess our sins, if we repent of our sins and turn to God, if we confess them, he is just, he is faithful, he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the world would say today that really you won't die from your sin. Heard that before? Uh, they instead would say, no, I'm going to act out in my sin. My sin, that they even don't call their sin, is just my expression for who I am. My urges, my appetites, my desires are me, and the more I just act on them, the better off I will feel. I have been accepted perfect. I don't need anybody else's love. I am enough and all that kind of stuff away from God. And so they just act on their own, right? They, they would say that they don't need to repent of their sin. They just need to act out on their sin. In fact, the reason for the struggle in their life, if they have struggled, they admit to it. If there's, if there's pain, if there's problems in their life, they would say the answer to that or the reason for that is because it's someone else's fault. There's a patriarchy that I need to blame. There's a, uh, there's a race that I need to blame. There's a, a group that I need to blame. And because they won't let me be myself, I'm gonna cancel them. And therefore they, they diminish the fact that they think their sin is actually gonna cause them death. They say, I just wanna act out on my sin and I'll blame everybody else and I'll cancel everybody else, and I'll punish everybody else, because my problems are your fault, not my fault. The message of the gospel is the opposite of that. The message of the gospel is, I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the only way to life is by acknowledging I am a sinner and coming to Jesus. Not flaunting my sin, not blaming you for my sin, not canceling you because you won't let me do my sin. No, I repent of my sin and I come to Jesus Christ. That's truth, amen? So you see, our, our response and our truth that we believe is counter to that of the world today. And so it, it raises some questions about what do we do, what are we to do with the culture? How do we respond to the culture that is going in a completely opposite direction than us. They despise our message. They want to cancel us. They want to do away with us. How do we respond to that? And you're watching in real time, you're watching churches respond to this in very different ways today. There are some churches that say, well, the way we're gonna handle it is that we are gonna isolate ourselves away from the culture. We're just gonna pull back, pull away, and have nothing absolutely to do with them. We're gonna develop our own community, our own care, and we are just gonna back away and hide, pull away, and isolate away from the culture. I recognize there's some need for some of that. 
There's a reason that we are gathered here today because Jesus has called the church together and we are gathering to be together. And I recognize we are in this moment isolated from the world, but hear me clear. This is not our end game to stay isolated away from the world. We'll explain more of that here in just a moment. Uh, There's another approach that some churches take. They say, well, no, we should take the approach of condemning the world, calling out the world, showing all their sin, pointing out all their failures, all their flaws, telling where they're wrong. And I recognize there's a place for that. Jesus called out people's sin. Jesus called out the sins of the culture in his day, the religious culture in his day. And it cost him. He didn't, he wasn't arrested and crucified just because he was so nice to everybody. He was arrested and crucified because he spoke against the culture of the day. He spoke the truth and the way and the life that was through him and they didn't like it. It was offensive. In every generation, every culture, there will be people who will be offended by the gospel. We can't let that cause us to say, oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. You'll never find Jesus saying, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. And so it is our call to speak truth. But hear me clear. That is not our only call. Is to just stand here or sit here on the corner and shout out how bad everything is and condemn everything that's going on in the world today. That alone is not the answer. Also, the other way that some churches are handling what's happening in the world today is they would seek to embrace what's happening. They say, well, you know, they do have some good truths out there that we need to adopt into our own ministry philosophy. And you don't have to go far to find churches who have embraced secular and worldly ideology, who are embracing um, things even like critical race theory, social justice, Um, sexual freedom and um, gender fluidity. You can go down all those paths and still be in an American church today. And it's disturbing because it's causing, in some ways, it's really kind of like a double-edged sword almost. In some ways, it's causing churches to fall away, which is tragic, but it's causing the true church to rise to the top and stand and proclaim the truth. Amen? So what what you're watching today is a lot of churches falling away. They're, They're losing their influence and their power because they've refused to keep lifting up the name of Jesus in the midst of a culture that is easily offended and stands in contradiction, opposition to all that we actually believe. And some churches think that the way to reach the culture is to become like the culture. Now, there are some places and ways that we do um, become like those that we reach. We're going to talk about all that today. But we can never yield, compromise, or bend on the truth of the gospel and what it says. Because the day we do that is the day we stop being the church. The day you stop lifting up Jesus is the day he will stop drawing all men to himself in your presence. He will choose someone else to do that. I don't want to be the church that he passes over and says, I'm going to have to choose another group to be the one that I will draw all to. Amen? So it's not, it's not our call to embrace the secular worldview the seemingly religious approach of just love everyone and their philosophies as well. It's also not our call to do what some do and are just completely ignoring what's happening in the culture. I get it. I get that you want to just get away from all that stuff. I get it. But the church has never been called to just deny that it's happening out there or ignore what's happening. Uh, I I know well-meaning Christians who take that approach. They want their church experience 
to have no conversation about what's going on in the world, and they want their Christian experience to have little to do with what's going on in the world today. And I get it. I get that you want to keep it neat and compartmentalized and safe and, and sanitized, and it's your run-to and your go-to. But look, we are, we are not called to sanitized, compartmentalized faith. Jesus and the church are not a piece of the pie. Jesus and the church are the pie plate to which all the pieces of the pie of life sit. Amen? Uh, we, we've talked about that here already. So if these are not our option, what is to be our option? Well, again, our role as the people of God, the church of Jesus Christ, the one who is the head and we are his body, our call is to do what he says. And so if he says something, and if he is interested in something, then that's what we are to do. So we turn to scripture. Who tells us or what tells us what he is passionate about and what he is interested in? And we've already seen the verses and I'll bring it to you again today. Jesus came to pursue. He came to seek and save that which was lost and those which, oops, are lost. This is our call. This is our responsibility. This is our responsibility individually, and this is our responsibility as the body, the collective body together. This is what Jesus came to do. And we know from the New Testament that every follower of Jesus Christ and those who built the church in the earliest days, those who had the closest communication, those that we go back to and we say, all right, this is as close to the source as we can get. We turn to them because the Bible tells us what they said and what they did. Today we turn to the apostle Paul. He was one of the ones who had an experience with Jesus Christ after the other disciples he meets Jesus on a road. He's blinded by his glory. And then Jesus calls him into ministry. So whatever Paul says next should be very important to us. Whatever Paul says about the church should be important to us. How he developed his strategy, his involvement, and what was important to him. And whatever he says and does is what should be what's important to us as well. Now, I therefore entitled my message today, I'm playing to win. Paul is about to tell us that he is all about winning, about pursuing those things that are lost. And he was in it to win it. He wasn't in it to lose it. He wasn't in it for some casual interest. He was in it to win it. You're going to see that clearly today. And I'm hoping, my prayer is, that this pulls us to a new level of passion as the church in our day. Amen? So, with that in mind, um, often around the office, the church office, Hunter will use a phrase that uh, the first time he said it was intriguing to me, and I keep using, oh, hey Hunter, <laughs> just happened to time that very well. I'm like, are you coming up here or what? No. So, um, here's the phrase that Hunter uses. He says, no one stumbles into greatness. Dude, somebody needs to write that down. That's awesome. No one stumbles into greatness. In other words, you don't just accidentally have greatness happen in your life. You don't just all of a sudden walk into your kitchen one day and say, oh my goodness, the ingredients that I had here for cookies all came together and made a plate of cookies for me. It just doesn't happen. You don't just stumble into some cookies happening in your kitchen. Hello? You don't just uh, go into work one day and say, oh my goodness, we haven't been doing really anything to promote our business. We haven't been doing anything to try to grow it. We haven't been doing anything to be strategic about it. But my goodness, the company's profitable. It's awesome. People know about us. The phones are ringing off the wall. Our, our company is great all of a sudden. That doesn't happen, right? No one stumbles into greatness. You don't just accidentally have greatness happen. You don't just ignore your children 
be mean to your children, be separate from your children, give no attention to your children, choose to not bring faith into the home for your children, never speak spiritual truths to your children, and have them one day rise up and say, I love God more than anything else in my life. It doesn't just happen unless God chooses for that to happen. But I'm telling you as a parent, and you know this, you don't just stumble into children who are mature. You don't just stumble into children who know how to say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, no, ma'am, no, sir, thank you, you're welcome, open the door for another person, serve other people, make good grades in school. That doesn't just accidentally happen, right? You don't just stumble into greatness. Jesus didn't just stumble into greatness when he came to earth. He didn't just say, you know, I'm just going to, go down there and just hang out, just see what happens. I mean, who knows, you know, (laughs) we'll just see. I don't know. I mean, we'll just see what happens. I mean, I'm just going to hang out on a hillside and maybe some folks will come to me. Maybe they won't. I mean, if they do, that'd be cool. But uh, maybe I find 10 or 12 guys. I don't know. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. I'm just going to kind of stay in the background and just do my thing. Just see what happens. That's not how Jesus functioned. Jesus came with intentionality. Jesus came with a purpose that had been given to him by his father. Jesus went from place to place. He went with intentions and he called disciples. He called them by name. He called them to himself and he called them to a purpose and he trained them and he strategized and he lined them up and he sent them out and there was purpose and he worked with them and he developed them and he he even corrected them along the way and he sent them back out and he lived his life with intentionality and purpose and in pursuit, amen? Amen. He wasn't just random. He wasn't just casual. He didn't just chill on a rock outside of town waiting to see what might happen. He didn't just stroll into town on Sundays to see, I don't know, see what happens today. No, Jesus was very, very intentional. Jesus was very, very strategic. Jesus was very, very passionate. Jesus had prayer that went into the work that he did. He had great love for what he did and he was strategic about what he did because he came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you and I want to see some things in our life pursued and sought and saved that have been lost, we are going to have to be intentionally active in that process. You can't just random the whole thing. You can't just watch and see what's going to happen without taking any action and praying to God. You have to be active in the process. Amen. So the apostle Paul gives us his strategy. Turn your Bibles to first Corinthians chapter nine. First Corinthians is one of the letters that the apostle Paul wrote to a church, the church in Corinth. And what Paul lays out in first Corinthians nine is a strategy He tells us how he goes about doing ministry. And the Apostle Paul is the guy who helped implement and strategize and put into place all the principles that you and I know of as church today. We're doing what we do because he did what Jesus told him to do in the word of God. Amen. This is not something we just made up. This is not something we're doing because a lot of other people are doing it on Sunday morning. We are following the instruction of Jesus in his word. And it's important. And the apostle Paul was closest to it. And so 1 Corinthians 9, I'm going to start reading in verse 19. There's always so much you want to read and tell about the context of what's happening here. But I'm going to jump into verse 19. Uh, Paul is talking about his ministry. He's talking about why he does what he does. He's telling us about his strategy, his intentionality. Here's what he says in verse 19. He says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. Paul says, you know, I am not bound by what the culture tells me. I'm not a slave to them. I'm not bound by even the religious culture in his day that he had come out of. He said, I'm not afraid of them. I don't serve them. I serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And if Jesus tells me something and it's counter to what the world and the culture or even the religious system tells me, I'm going to do what Jesus tells me to do. 
And so Paul says, I'm free. I'm not afraid of them. I'm not bound by them. I'm not measuring my success by them. I am free from all men. But here's the deal, Paul said. I have made myself a servant. Now, this is a word that means an intentional servant or slave. He put himself intentionally in a place to serve other people, and he tells us why. He wasn't doing it because he was afraid of what they might think of him. He was trying to get crowd approval or more likes on uh, Jerusalem book or whatever, you know. That, that wasn't his deal. He, he said, I'm free from all that. I, I'm, I'm way past all that. I found my acceptance in Jesus Christ. He said, but I'll put myself in a position to be a servant to others because I want to win the more. I'm intentionally strategizing with great prayer, passion, and love to win the more. Paul's unashamed about it. He didn't say, eh, you know, we'll just travel around a few cities. You know, we might, we might meet if it's convenient. You know, there's a place we'll hang out, you know, sip some coffee and, you know, be cool and, you know, play some music maybe, you know, and we'll just see what happens. No, Paul says, look, I am intentionally strategizing my life and my ministry around the purpose of one thing. I want to see people one to Jesus. He said, I'm not content with just milling about the culture. I'm not content with just me trying to earn some stuff along the way. I am passionate, Paul said, to see people convinced, persuaded, brought out of their sin and won to Jesus. And he says, I'm doing it so I can win the more. Then he describes how he's going to do it. Verse 20. He says, and to the Jews, which he had come from, those who knew the Old Testament heritage and laws, he said, to them, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. He said, I'm intentionally putting myself in environments and settings that are different than me he said, I came out of being a Jew. They rejected Jesus Christ, but I'm walking back up into that environment because I know their language, I know their practices, I know their lifestyle, and I'm going right back up into it so that I can win Jews out of it and win them to Christ. That's intentional. That's strategic. That is love. And that is Paul in prayer for that to happen. Verse, or the second part of that, verse 20. He says, to those who are under the law, those who still believe that their um, affection and calling with God is based on their ability to keep the law. He said, to them, I came to them as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. I want to help them. I want to rescue them. I'm not here to just condemn them. I'm not here to just isolate myself away from them. I'm not here to hide from them. I am here to get in with them so that I can win more to Jesus. He goes on. Verse 21. To those who are without law, to those who don't have a framework for morality, to those who are just living as their own law, doing their own thing. He said, to them that are without law, I go as those without law. Hold up, Paul. Sounds like you're saying you're going to go in with the group that doesn't know Christ and they're living for themselves, doing all kind of weird stuff, and you're going to get up in that group, Paul? Parentheses, Paul says, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. He says, I'm going to go where they go, but hear me clear. I'm not going to compromise my convictions when I get in the midst of them. I'm going to keep my obedience to Christ while I'm in with them, but I'm going in to win them. He goes on, uh, verse 22. He said, to the weak, I became as weak, that I might win the weak. To those who struggle to believe, to those who've been through heartache and loss, to those who hurt, to those who just can't seem to make it. Whatever they put their hand to, it just seems to fall apart. Whatever they try, doesn't work. To them that are weak, he says, 
I became as weak. He said, I went in with them and told them about my own stories of when I recognized I was weak. And I went in not to yell at them, not to condemn them, but to win them. He says, I have become all things to all men that I by all means save some. He says, I get it. I may not get everybody, but that's not going to stop me from getting some. And I'm going to be passionate. I'm going to be engaged. I'm going to be strategic. I'm going to be passionate. I'm going to be loving. And I'm going to pray because I want to do what Jesus is about and he came to seek and save that and those that are lost. And so that's what Paul said he was about. Paul was saying, I do a lot of things in my life, but this is what I'm about. So I'm going to leverage my work, my resources, my relationships, my hobbies, my influence, my place in the community, I'm going to leverage every one of those toward a single goal. How can I see someone to Christ? How can they be brought to him, convinced that he is Lord, that he is the truth and the way and the life, that there's forgiveness in him, there's redemption in him, that there's life in him? Verse 23, Paul said, Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Paul said, there's a reason I do all this. He said, I'm not looking for accomplishment points. I'm not looking for applause from the crowd. I'm not looking for people to like me. He says, I want to do what Jesus has called me to do. The spirit that's in him is the spirit that was in Paul, is the spirit that's in us, and he has told us what he's all about, to seek and to save that and those that are lost. Amen? So this has to be our passion and our pursuit as well. There's some things that we must do. If we're going to be a church that does this, that looks like Jesus, that truly is the hands and feet and body of Christ on earth, if we're going to do what the spirit in Jesus is saying in us, in the same spirit, then we have to do some things. We have to be first ones who pray. No one comes to the Father unless the Father draws them. But there are people in our realms, our world, our communities, our circles of influence that you know that are without Christ today. And you know it because you hear them talk. You see the struggles. You see their life. And there's something in you that hurts for them. That's the spirit of Christ in you. And so the first thing you and I must do individually and as a church is pray for those around us. Because there are walls that have been built by the enemy in their minds. There have been hurts that they have been through that have put up walls in their mind. The enemy has deceived. There's a reason they have not yet come to Christ. And we have to do the first work of praying and doing spiritual warfare, binding the enemy calling down the spirit to work in their life. And I know that he can do that on his own without us, but he has chosen and called us to pray as the way that he will do that. And so we have to do that. We have to pray and bind the enemy who has caused that person, you know, who has been through hurts. They have built up walls of resistance and they become bitter. They become angry. Maybe they become depressed. Maybe they become anxious. Those are spiritual realities that are holding them at bay. 
And we have to pray first for the blinders to be removed, for Satan to be stopped, and for those walls to be brought down before we can even do the work of sharing the gospel to reach them. This is where we have to start. This is what our calling is as the church, is to pray. That's why part of what we do here has to, and I'll just say it, some of that's going to have to change for us as a church. And I own that as your pastor in not leading us enough to pray for what's around us. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of people moving to this area. There's a lot already here, but there is more here. And it's just become an even greater burden for me that these people, they're struggling. They're hurting. They're not in physical poverty necessarily, but they're in spir spiritual poverty. They may not be physically blind, but they're blind to the glories and the reality of Jesus Christ. They may not be Well, or they may be on the outside all put together. But you could be put together on the outside and be all broken up on the inside. And there are families, marriages, children, and young people. Young, young children and older, senior adults who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's our responsibility because God has put us here in this area. I may not be responsible for, uh, you know, what's happening in Oklahoma today, but we are responsible for what's happening in Ovilla today and our surrounding area. Amen? So we have to pray. But I would say also, based on what we see from Paul, we have to be intentional in what we do. If you've ever tried this approach to your own spiritual growth, you know how effective this is well, I mean, I'm not going to read my Bible or pray. I'm just going to see if God, you know, just speaks during the day to me. I'm just going to see what happens. I'm just going to go with the flow. You know, I'm just going to see what happens and see if the Lord shows up. And I don't really get into reading and, you know, the Bible and all that stuff or praying. I mean, I'm just going to see, just sense and see what happens. I get sense and see what happens, but I also know without my first seeking God in his word and submitting my heart and mind to him, I can sense and see about a lot of weird stuff in life and end up doing a lot of silly stuff too. It's only when I surrender my heart and say, Jesus, speak to me. And he does in prayer and he does in his word that I find direction. Amen? And I, you, you can't build your life on anything else but the word of God. And if the church doesn't build its mission and purpose and our gathering on the word of God, then we're just wasting our time. I'm not about wasting time. Amen. So we have to be intentional. You don't just say, oh my goodness, I hadn't prayed in two years. I hadn't even opened a Bible in three years, but my goodness, I feel like I have more spiritual wisdom and insight than I've ever had before. That doesn't happen. If it does, there's something wrong with you. It comes through intentionality. It comes through sacrifice. It comes through discipline. It comes through intentionality. God, you are the one who drives my life. Jesus, you are Lord of my life. And I'll, I'll, I'll hear from you first and take my marching orders from you. And the church must do that as well. We must be intentional. I think it's easy for us to come here and say, we'll just see what happens. Maybe some folks will come. Maybe they won't. Maybe God will speak to them. Maybe he won't. Look, our calling is to be intentional about lifting up the name of Jesus. If you're not intentional about lifting him up, he's not going to be intentional about blessing you and bringing all men in. Blessing comes with obedience. That's what he's called us to. So we must be intentional about the work. We have to be intentional about what we do here intentional about every one of our ministries. And, and when our staff meets, this is, this is square one for us. What is our purpose? What is the vision? And how does that fit in every one of our ministries? Why are we doing this event? What is the purpose here? What has God called us to do? And I want to see that increase for us as a church. More intentionality toward pursuing that and those who are lost. That's what Paul said. 
Um, we also have to be, another word like it is strategic. Having a strategy, having a plan. And I realize if you've been in a church that was all about strategy and not about the spirit of God, this moment right here will feel really cold to you. I get it. I get it. It's easy to have been burned in some churches because they were overly strategic and overly intentional and there was no sense of real compassion in life and it seemed like it was all about them and it was all about, you know, getting some more money in, becoming more, you know, having more notoriety. Anybody know what I'm talking about here this morning? Okay, you know what I'm talking about? You've been there, seen that, done that. I hope you know that is not what this church is about. We're not about making a name for ourselves. We're not about just trying to make some money. We're not about trying to just build a a kingdom. We're all about building the kingdom here. We're all about proclaiming the gospel. We're all about Jesus being lifted up so that he will do the work of drawing all men. But that means we have to be strategic. Paul said some very strategic terms. I made myself, I became like the weak that I might win the weak. Paul was never a weak guy. Paul is the guy who, before he comes to Christ, is persecuting and killing Christians. He is all of a sudden being strategically weak in order to reach the weak. Strategic. But the other piece that's super essential for us is that what we do, we do out of love. We do out of sacrifice. We do out of intentionality. We do out of strategy, but we do it out of love for someone else. We're willing to lay down our life for someone else. We're willing to give up for someone else. We're willing to use what we have to reach someone else. We don't count them as gone. We don't count them as lost. We don't just condemn them. We don't just isolate from them. We don't just embrace the world. We don't just ignore the world. We seek and we reach and we do what Jesus did. A few verses, and then I have a story to tell you this morning with one of our own here at Vertical. The pursuit of Jesus was very clear. Jesus himself said in John 3, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He wasn't just talking about heaven. He was talking about life here on earth. But here's also some sobering words that Jesus said. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. Sobering words for us. There are people today in our world, in our community, they're our neighbors, they're coworkers, and they're living with the heaviness upon them. They live in rejection. They live in anxiety. They live in angst. They live in bitterness. They live in broken relationships. They live with confusion. It's because they have no peace with God through Jesus. And the only hope they have is in someone sharing with them the hope of Jesus Christ. And if that hope is in us, then we are called to be intentional, strategic, praying, and loving them. Second Peter tells us what the heart of the Lord is. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's not God's will to just say, eh, kind of done with them. No, his desire is that they would repent of their sin and come to him. If that's his heart, that must be our heart as well. Now, I want, to, uh, I want you to hear a story today from one of our own. And you're going to see how God has done this in them and how he is still working this through them. So, let me introduce to you Teresa Brindley. Teresa, make your way up here to the stage. Y'all give Teresa a hand, and she's going to tell you, yeah, come on up. <clears throat> she's going to tell you about her, uh, her situation here that she's with physically today, um, but she's also going to more importantly tell us some things about spiritually what God is doing in her life. Yeah, 
Yeah, you can sit wherever you want to sit. You, too many choices, huh? Good choice. <laughs> it's close. All right. So y'all know Teresa. You've seen her here around the church. Yeah. And um, Teresa has a story. We're going to tell part of it today. Um, Teresa, talk first about uh, physically what's going on. We've prayed for you before. Tell us what's going on with physically with you. Oh, I need a microphone for her. Duh. That would help. <clears throat> Thank you. No, don't do that. Here you go. Okay. I, um, I'm doing better. My, my strength is better since, since I did the, um, what I do with the, the stem cell. Thank you. <clears throat> Memory's not good, but everything else mm-hmm. is. Okay. And what do, what do we start with? What, what, what's going on physically with you here? I am walking better. Yes. I have more strength. I have more upper body strength. I'm not as dizzy. Yes. And the original condition was? Well, I have MS. Okay. I still have MS. Okay. But the symptoms are better okay. than they used to be. All right. So uh, physically, that's what's going on. Let's yes. go back and, and, and help, us, help us have some context today. Talk, talk for just a moment about the home you grew up in. I grew up in a non-Christian home. Um, I didn't have a mom and dad telling me Christian things and God's love growing up. And um, I mean, it wasn't bad, but it's what I knew. So yeah. yeah. So this leads you to a place. Uh, Teresa and I've talked a couple different times about her story, and uh, Heather and I went over one day and listened, and I, I just wrote notes. And- yeah. Kept her in the page and notes about her life. So you're getting the very condensed version today. Um, it led you to a place as a young person, uh, very consumed with wanting people's approval, yes. affection, yes. Uh, attention. Yes, that's what I, I got my, my feeling of self by being approved by others. My, as much as many people like, if they like me more, I felt better about myself. I felt right. better about myself if they liked me more. So that, that was what I did. So you meet a man and you marry. It's not Terry. This, this gentleman that I'm about to tell you about has since died. So um, you meet him fairly young and you mm-hmm. marry and you begin to be involved um, in, a, in a lifestyle that's very immoral. Mm-hmm. Uh, I almost speak in somewhat code here. Uh, her and her husband together were involved in immorality with other couples. Mm-hmm. And this was a, this was your life, yes, for, yes it was. for many many years, mm-hmm. and that obviously, though it was something you were seeking attention, approval, and affection yes. in, it didn't it didn't lead to that for you. I thought it was a way of making him better. Mm-hmm. Making him, I don't I don't know what I was doing, but I yeah. thought I was trying to make him feel better about himself, and yeah. he was so lost. Yeah. So uh, eventually... But we went to church in the middle of it. Wow. Compartmentalization. There you go. That's true. That's true. It happens. Yes. So uh, eventually you come to a realization, this is not what God has called us to. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. He and you leave. Uh, you, you're no longer together. He dies. Yeah. yeah. And then you alone. And then um, some time later, and but we're just, we're just condensing a big story down into yes, little pieces. Are. Yes, we are. Um, you meet Terry. And uh, it's at a time. I've known Terry since I graduated from high school. Ah, that's right. That's right. So new, new Terry. Comes back Terry into comes into back life, into life. Back in my life. Terry's the guy. Terry's the guy with the long beard you see at the door. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so fast forward again. We're about in the early two thousands, mm-hmm. and you're going to a church in Waxahachie, later Middle Othian, called Encounter. That's where I was. Yes, yes, he was. Yeah, yes. so um, we meet, do a wedding. She recommits her life to Christ in that day. I didn't know all of the backstory at that point. Right. Um, and there, she's even baptized. Uh, we baptize her. This is early 2000s. It's um, that that got me to release my um, anger and, and resentment towards my mother. And I was able to forgive her mm. through that. That was, okay. that that was, was a That's right. That's a significant forgiving. point for her because it helps her be free from all the things that she resented her mom for. Mm. All the broken and uh, anger and resentment there. Um, so 
Um, you've grown, obviously, a lot since then. Some time has passed. You've continued in church. Mm-hmm. Uh, faithful women's Bible study. The women have poured into your life. And you've made a decision even recently to do something um, to help bring some healing for your children. Because you yes. had children during yes. all of that oh, yes. time. Oh, yes. Uh, old enough to have gone through some of that. They knew what was going on. I mean, when I think back to that, it, it crushes me. But they knew what was going on. I, which, you know, it, it's... Yeah. So with the Lord's guidance, but also with some counsel from women here, you took a step recently to help pursue mm-hmm. that which was lost. Yes. Tell about what you did. I wrote a letter to my son um, taking ownership of everything, saying, I'm sorry I did this. I am sorry I exposed you to all of those things. I did the same with Veronica. I physically told her and talked about it. And um, I did it with my other daughter, Alexis. And I wrote a, wrote, a, wrote a letter apologizing, taking ownership for everything I did and, you know, exposing them to those things that they should have never been exposed to in the first place. I mean, representing a mom that shouldn't have been a mom like that. I'm sorry I did it. And, yeah. you know, apologizing for everything. Yeah. So that is a picture of Jesus seeking that which was lost. You yes. see it? Yes. Pursuing those things. And what a, what a courageous step, a humble step, but a powerful step to take. Um, we don't know the fruit from all that yet. No, it's fairly fresh it's, it's and fresh. new. Well, I tell you, my son is watching this right now. Amen. 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 Yeah. So, because of what uh, the Lord has been doing in her life, she came to me a couple weeks back and said, uh, I really... I really want to be baptized. Of course, I'm running the tape back in my mind. I think, we, we did this. <laughs> we did this before. So you, you answer me because I, I was curious. Why are we doing this again? So you tell, you tell us, why are we doing this again? Um, we're doing this again because the story we just told, that part of my life, I've taken ownership of that part of my life. I have ask my children for forgiveness for that. And that was a big thing. And I feel like that needs to be part of it too. I mean, that's like getting it all out, getting it all out. Everything that's hiding is now out in the open. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing. Okay. So not that everybody has to be baptized a second time, third time, all of that. But I think we have evidence from the book of Acts where there were uh, believers there in that day who had been baptized under John. John the baptizer, but then they heard about the gospel and the Holy Spirit, and it was all of a sudden a new day for them. They did not realize what awaited them and what was theirs in Christ, and when that happened for them, they said, we want to be baptized now in this new life. So that's why Teresa is here today. Um, It's not a requirement. I didn't tell her she had to. Uh, The only time we say it's a have to is when you're first born again. If you want to walk in obedience to Christ, the next step is baptism. But we've baptized many people here a second time because maybe the decision was made when they were a child. Maybe it was a decision they made as a young person. Maybe some significant things have happened in their life, like Teresa's, that she says, I want to make this public. And then what Teresa told me the other day when when we talked was she said, um, This is really my family. And I want to do this with my family present. So I couldn't turn her down on those two two conditions. Amen. So, wow. What a mess. Thank you. I want to tell you one thing. Terry, God brought Terry to me. And we're together because of that. Through the Holy Spirit, through talk through Terry, and that's 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 our how we're together. I mean, it just the whole thing just came together. Yeah, Amen. So, do you see the grace of God in this? Do you see uh, what Romans says: where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Where there has been failure, God can redeem and restore, because He comes to pursue that which is lost.
And you feel it. You feel it. You know you. it. Yeah. You feel it. Exactly. I mean, and the so, whole time I always felt like there was something more. I need to do this. Yeah. I felt it. So two things I'd say. If this morning you would say, that all just resonates with me. You may have been baptized before, and this is a reminder to you or an encouragement to you to want to be baptized again. Come see me afterwards. We'll talk. But I would also say, Teresa's story is like many people out in our community that are waiting for someone to, sh- to seek them out, to pursue them, to share life with them, to share truth with them so that we can see new life here. Amen? Amen. So I'd like to do this. Uh, I'd like to invite some women to come stand with Teresa here. We're going to pray for her, and then we're going to make our way back here and baptize Teresa. So, uh, ladies, y'all come stand with her. Ladies, y'all come up on the stage and stand with her. Yeah, y'all gather around. All right. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you are the one who came to seek and to save that and those who were lost. You're the one who came to give the oil of gladness and joy where there has been such darkness and destruction. You're the one who brings grace where sin has abounded. You're the one who heals those things that are broken. I thank you for Teresa, her willingness to be vulnerable about some very weak areas in her life, but some areas that now you are making strong by your grace. I thank you for the women here who have had such an impact in her life to speak truth, to speak life, hope. I pray that today that the steps she's seeking and taking to pursue those things that are lost, that you'll bring fruit from those. You'll restore relationships that have been broken, heal what has been lost, and make all things new and show yourself strong in the midst of it. You've promised to do that. We take you up on that promise and believe it will happen because you are being lifted up in this moment and you will draw family, friends, and others to restoration through this. So I thank you for Teresa. I pray this moment will be forever etched in her mind as well as all of us about the power of redemption and what you pursue. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Yeah. Here's Terry. I'm going to let him help you. He knows you better than me. So now you'll have a different perspective next time you see Teresa when she come in the door. You'll know how to pray for her more and uh, be excited to see what God's doing in her life. But what a powerful story of hope and redemption. Yeah, let's come forward a little bit. Perfect, perfect. Shima, you want to leave those glasses on? All right, beautiful, beautiful. Just right there for just a moment. Take a deep breath. Look out here at all these folks. These are your family, your church family. Thank you for being willing to follow what the Lord has done. It's been on her heart for a while, and it's been on her heart to even share her story. And as we said, that takes courage. But it's out of that that the beauty of Christ shines so greatly. So, Teresa, I'm excited today. There's an old Teresa we're about to baptize. Not physically old, but I mean a spiritually old Teresa. <laughs> that's right. We're about to resurrect a new, a new Teresa. Because that's what baptism is a picture of. Our old life buried and our new life risen in him. This is what Jesus did for us. It's what he calls us to do. So, I happily excitedly baptize you as my sister in Christ. You are buried with him in baptism. Raised to walk. Amen.